Sure appreciate y'all being here. It's going to be a blessing this morning. Let's pray together. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy and forgiveness. And Lord, thank you for calling and choosing us for such a time as this. Um, Lord, we, we ask that we would experience your mercy afresh and anew this day. And Lord, at the same time, you would instill in us a, a passion to, to follow after you. And Lord, as we do so, that your light would shine through us. Lord, I, we pray that our hearts our minds, our spirits would be open and attentive to the word of life, Lord, that our, our hearts would be good soil that you could actually bring forth a harvest. And Lord, as we lift your name in praise and worship, we thank you for your habitation, your dwelling amidst us. And Lord, I, I pray that as we are touched, that we actually encounter your presence in such a way that we're never the same. By the grace of God and in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. Let's worship together.
appreciate that. Thank you. That was awesome. All right, can everybody hear me? Good. We got the sound going. I need everybody in here to quit being ugly. Right? You're like, oh snap, that's not a good way to start it off, right? Y'all ever heard that before? My aunt used to say me all the time. She said, God don't like ugly. Anybody ever heard that term before? Anybody ever said, nobody ever heard that before? I said, man, God don't like ugly. Next time somebody tells you that, then just be like, well, then why he make you? No, I'm playing. Don't say that. <laughs> don't say that. Usually ugly is the term when they use it that way to say, I don't like the way you're talking. I don't like your attitude. I don't like what you're doing. God don't like ugly. And the reason that I come out here and start off with, we got to quit being ugly, talking about all of us, is because I think sometimes we allow ourselves to be ugly. We allow ourselves to think that we're ugly, but I need you to think ugly in the terms of the old kid's story, The Ugly Duckling. Anybody heard that story? So most of you have heard The Ugly Duckling, right? It's a story about this bird. If you haven't heard it, it's a story about this bird that's traveling around with these other ducklings, and he don't fit in. Like, he's ugly. He looks at the other ducklings like, man, I don't look like y'all. I don't sound like y'all. I don't walk like y'all. And as the story continues, at the very end of the story, you realize it's because he's a swan. He was never meant to be a duckling in the first place, so he was comparing himself to the wrong thing to begin with. He was judging himself off of the wrong standard, and I think as Christians, we do that all the time. As people that are going through life, we're usually looking for standards that we can judge ourselves according to, looking to say, hey, what success actually look like? How do I know if I'm doing a good job? So we look for the stats, we look for anything we can, but in doing so, we make ourselves ugly because we're trying to measure up to something that God never created us to be. That's why I say let's stop being ugly and figure out what does God actually have for us? What does his word say for us? And to do that, we're going to compete a little bit. Like Salim was saying, I played sports back in the day. I played football up at Notre Dame. Before that, I was here in Houston. Me and my wife both grew up in Houston right down 59. We was in A-Leaf in Sugar Land. She played softball. I did football. We did all that stuff in sports. And competing is one of the ways that I actually learn more about God and grow in God. And so what I want to do today is I want to compete a little bit. And so I'm going to need some volunteers that are willing to compete with some of these beautiful metal objects we have up here. Now, I guarantee you it's not going to be anything crazy. You're not going to, like, get super sweaty or anything. You're not going to get injured or hurt or anything like that. But I need five volunteers. Can I get five people that are willing to come up here and compete? Okay, cool. I see one. I think I saw, okay, two over here. I got you three. I need two more. I need two more. Okay, right here. Got you. And then, yep, let's go. Five, come on. Yeah, come on. If I pointed you out, come up here. Wait, hold on. Wait, hold on. I got six now. Wait a sec. Hold on. I think I got too many. Nope, we're good. One, two, three, four. Nope, hold on. Is that six? I can't count. Hold on. I pointed to the wrong way then. All right. Here we go. Here we go. I oh, appreciate that, man. You letting somebody else get a chance. One, two, three, four, five. Hold on. We had one more. Dang. Okay, cool. We're going to make it work like this. Yeah, come on. We're going to find something for you to do. We're going to find something. Come on. We get real creative around here. As a matter of fact, I know what we're going to do with you. you we're going to be real creative. All right, so here's the way this competition is going to work. And I'm going to need all y'all's help pointing out a few things. You just, you just get ready. We're going to do something a little bit different, okay? What they're going to do is they're all going to pick up weights, right? When they pick up these weights, they're going to have to hold them out like this. Yep, you hold them for as long as you can right here. As soon as they go below parallel, they're out. Simple, right? Hold it up right here. As soon as you go below parallel, you're out. But hold on, time out, because y'all messed it up. I'm running, I'm running combo right now. Y'all don't get to pick your weights. I'm going to get to pick the weights. Y'all messed it up. All right, so. I like you here. You're good. <laughs> let me switch. Matter of fact, let me switch you two. You here. Yep, you over there. And then just because I don't want y'all to have picture on weights, y'all two switch too. Yep, y'all two switch too. And then you, come, come on, fam. And so here, you know what a bridge is? You know, like the bridge? Yeah, like a plank. There we go. So I need you to plank. And then you got to hold your plank, but I'm going to have you being like one leg up and then one leg up. And then if you start to act like Superman or something, we're going to be like one leg, one arm. So you're going to work all kinds of core balance. Is that cool? All right, you do need that. We all need that. Let's go. All right, so remember, hold it out here as long as you can. As soon as you go below parallel, out. Can y'all help me like, you know what I'm saying, see who goes below parallel and all that? Can y'all help me with that? Thank you, all six of you. Appreciate that. So go ahead, grab your weights. 
When I say go, remember, right up here, shoulder wall, you got to hold them up. You just go ahead and start. <laughs> We're just going to start you early, <laughs> flat. All right, on your mark, get set, go. All right, hold it up. Okay. <laughs> Appreciate you. What do you, no, no, no. Hold it up, hold it up. Come on, keep it up, keep it up. No, no, hold that leg up right there. Hold it, hold it. Now left leg, left arm out. Left arm and this leg. Stay even though. You're down. All right, hold on. She's still up. Oh, you're down. All right, cool. All right, so y'all here. Y'all keep moving. You stay up. You stay up. Y'all, y'all are good. I appreciate y'all. Y'all can put those down. We're good. We still got him up. Straighten that arm out, though. Who's going to last longer? Right down here. Is she going to last longer or is he going to last longer? She is. she is? Who we think? She is? Okay, so since you're doing so good, I need you to I'm give you a quick little pause. Walk down here towards him. I want you to stay on him. There you go. Keep going. Yeah. No, no, keep going. Just like that. Just like that. Just still hold it. You almost there. You almost there. Hey, straighten that arm out, fam. Straighten that arm. Did you just fall? Did he just fall? Oh, he already fell. He already fell. Last one standing. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. All right, y'all can have a seat. Thank you. I'm going to explain why here in a second. That was impressive. And you almost got away with it. Almost got away. Well, y'all supposed to tell me when he fell. Y'all just let him go and come back up. <laughs> there's a reason that we did that. I promise there's a point. We're going to come back to it. We're going to be in Matthew 25. So if you got a Bible, if you want to follow along on your phone, it's all good. Matthew 25, and it's going to be verse 14 going through verse 30. This is the parable of the talents. This is the parable of the talents. And so what you need to know in Matthew He's writing to a Jewish audience, right, talking about who Jesus Christ was, that he is the Messiah that was promised to come. Jesus has just got finished telling people that they're going to destroy the temple. He's going to die, but he's going to be resurrected again, right? But he's also saying, after I resurrect, I'm going to go away for a while. I'm going to go away and then come back. And so he begins to explain what the kingdom of God is like. And he uses these parables in Matthew 25 to say, this is what the kingdom of God is going to be like. And the main point that he's getting at is saying that, look, you don't know when I'm going to come back. Jesus Christ died. He resurrected. It was witnessed. People saw him walking around, saw the holes in his hand. He is who he says he is. He did what he said he was going to do. And then he ascended to heaven. And now those of us who believe are waiting for his return. We're waiting for him to come back. And he says, you have to be ready for my return because you never know when it's going to be. And so basically he's saying, stay ready. Because if you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. And so he says, stay ready as you look for me. Stay ready as you wait for me. Stay ready as you live for me. And this is what he says in the parable of the talents as he's talking about staying ready. So I'll read through this, and then we'll talk about why we have them over here holding weights in plank position. It says in verse 14, For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went and at once traded with them and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more saying, master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward saying, master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was mine with my own, or what was mine with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. 
and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so the first thing that we need to understand is that a talent isn't just the abilities that people have been given. In this context, when Jesus is talking about a talent, he's talking about money. He's saying he's given them five talents of money. And so a money is about a year's worth of salary. So he gave one guy five years worth of salary, two years worth of salary, one year's worth of salary. So these are amounts of money. And Jesus gives them to him. The master gives them to him and says, I'm going to come back and settle a council. Just like we talked about, God is going to come back. Christ is going to come back. He's going to settle accounts with us and say, what have you done with what I gave you? What have you done with the knowledge I gave you, the information I gave you, the talents I gave you, the opportunity, the relationships, everything is God's and he's going to come back and say, what have you done with it? And so as we look at this parable, we have to notice a few things. When it starts off, it says that he called to him his own servants and entrusted his own property. When he called these people up, it wasn't just some random folks that he said, hey, I don't know you, come here. Like, yeah, how, how would y'all respond if you saw me out here right in front of Beeland Chapel and was like, hey, yo, you, come here. Exactly. Y'all would look at me exactly like look at me right now like, what? Who is he? This are, these are his servants, people that he knows, people that he's actually employing. He calls them to himself and he entrusts his property. A lot of us need to understand that the things that we have are going to be given back to God one day. Naked we came into this world and we're going to go out the same way. Except you might have clothes in a coffin, but you're still going out with nothing. But everything that we have is actually God's. It says that he entrusted his stuff to us. When I loan things to friends, I don't expect to get it back beat up, do you? When I give things to people and say, hey, you want to borrow the car real quick? That's great. I don't want to see it on the news in the high-speed chase. I don't want to see a scratch on it. And I don't want it back with an empty tank. Quit being lazy. Right? I expect you to give back my stuff in good condition, if not better. So it's all God's to begin with. As you go through life and you look at the different things that you've been given, do you look at them as God's or as yours? Because that's what begins our problem is starting to think that everything that we do is ours. When we start to think of it as our stuff instead of God's stuff, we begin to think that we rule over these things instead of God ruling over these things. We think that it's all our responsibility instead of God's responsibility. But here's the thing I want you to catch as well. He says in verse 15, he called to him and trusted his own property. It says to one he gave how many talents? Y'all remember? Five. To another one he gave how many? Two. And to another one he gave how many? One. He gave them all separate talents. But it says to each according to his own ability. To each according to his own ability. Now, when y'all came up here, the five of y'all that came up here, they all went and stood at what? They all went and stood at different weights, right? And then I told them what they were going to have to do with the weights and what they start doing. No, 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 stay here, right? Because they started looking around and saying, okay, well, what am I going to do with each of these different weights? What, well, I don't want those weights because those may look heavier, especially when you say I got to hold these things out, right? But it says here in this passage that the master gave each talent according to what each servant could do as though the master knows every single thing about these people. That he knows what they're able to do. He knows what they're able to handle. He knows what's going to actually make them thrive. Anytime I do this exercise, we come up here and everyone's all excited until I say you got to hold your weights up like this. And then they start looking at the weights and be like, well, hold on, I don't want that one. Well, can I get a different one? We literally did this one in a chapel before we played against K-State. And we did the same thing with our team, and they were the same way, right? And they start looking around, well, how come I got this one? How come it's not fair? How often do you look around in life and think that things aren't fair? Anybody ever done that, or is that just me? Well, God, if I had that break, I would be doing okay. If that person knew what I was actually capable of, then I would be all right. If my boss knew certain things about me, or if I had the same opportunity or the same amount of money, then I would be doing better. As though God doesn't know the exact situation that we're already in. As though God doesn't know, if you didn't have this kind of struggle, you wouldn't have that kind of strength, so I need to put you through this kind of strain. But we don't think that kind of thing. We just start to look and we start to compare. And God says, what are you comparing? How many people up here that were doing planks or that were doing weights were the exact same person? Oh, none of them. It's crazy. Because we are different people, but we still compare ourselves to everyone else. We have different life circumstances, but we compare ourselves to everybody else. Even if you grew up in the same house, 
with the same mom or a same dad, you're still a different person, are you not? So then why do we go around looking like I should be doing what he's doing or I should be better than her or I should look a certain way? And we're comparing all these things that God says, they ain't got nothing to do with you. I put you in that situation. I put you in that circumstance because I knew what you could handle. I knew what would allow you to thrive. If I gave you five, you'd kill yourself. If I gave you one, you'd be bored. You got two, so use them. Because we forget that God actually knows everything that's going on. But that's the problem is we start to think, well, God, I know better. If you gave me another talent, if you gave me a different weight, no, I wanted it to look that way. I wanted to have that kind of response. And so then what are the servants' response? How do they respond when they get these different weights? The five, he came back, or when the master came back to the five, what did he say? He said, you gave me five, and what I do? I doubled it. I doubled up. Lord, you gave me five, I got five back. And what did the master say to him? Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And then... The servant that had two came up, and he said, Lord, you gave me two. How many did he give back to him? He gave him two more, so he did what? He doubled up too. He doubled up and said, you gave me two, I gave you two. And the master said, "Ah, that's cool, that's cute. You didn't do as much as the other guy, though. Is that what he said? No. He said the exact same thing verbatim, word for word, to the two servant that he said to the five servant. He says, well done, well done, good and faithful servant, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Enter into the joy of your master. It's crazy because the master is just as pleased with the five servant as with the two servant. But that's not the way that we look at things, is it? That's not the way that we judge things. Right? We judge based off of how many followers somebody has on Instagram as though that's been inspired by the Holy Spirit. We judge uh, Twitter and TikTok as if that's true. Then say, okay, well, they got this many likes. They have this many people. We look at those things. That's what we compare. And God's saying, what are you doing? I've given you something that I want you to use, and that's all I've ever asked of you is to use everything that I've given you. That's it. But the question is, are you wanting to please God or are you wanting to please people that change their minds like they change their clothes? You have to be seeking to look at what God has given us. And if we have that kind of mindset, that's what stops us from being ugly. Because we're not comparing ourselves to other people. It makes it really easy. Like I said, I work in the sports realm. And so it's easy when I'm working with athletes because they get nervous about certain things. They get upset. Like, well, I got to get this many stats or I got to get this many tackles or I got to make this many catches. I'm like, man, the goal shouldn't be how many catches or tackles that you get because you don't control the play call. You don't control what the other team does. The only thing you control is the opportunity and the ability that you've been given. So maximize all of that. And then all this other pressure goes away. So many of us are striving for certain GPAs, and that's great. I want you to have a great GPA. But I want you to know that if you get a 2-4, and that's the best that you can do, and you've been given everything that you've been, that God has given you, then he's pleased with a 2-4. And we can take all this pressure off saying, I've got to achieve a certain amount. I've got to get a job that has a certain amount of salary or people have to think something about me. Instead, we should be looking for the well done, good and faithful servant that God is telling the servants that they've been given because they are faithful with what they've been given. They're not looking around at what everybody else has. And so then... We get to the third servant. The third servant says, you gave me one talent. You gave me one talent, and I brought you back how many? (laughs) I brought you back the same thing you gave me. He said, you gave me that talent. I went and buried it in the ground. I went and found a hole. I buried it. You left. When you came back, let me dig it up. Let me give it to you. He says, because you're harsh, you reap where you don't sow, I'm afraid of you. Our view of God is going to impact and affect everything that we do for him and in this life. He was afraid because he said, man, God is harsh and God judges when he shouldn't. When in reality, God is just just and he's good. You don't want a God that's not just. You don't want a God that doesn't care when people do evil things or wrong things. It's just that half the time we don't want that God to be looking at us too. And so what happens is 
the master saying, okay, if that's who I am, if that's who you thought I was, then you should have at least put it with a banker to get interest instead of just burying it in the ground. He says, fine, well, then let me get what I gave you. I'm going to give it to this servant who's actually been faithful with it. And you, he calls a wicked and slothful servant wicked because of how you are thinking about me and acting towards me because of your own thoughts. Slothful because you're lazy, you're afraid to make a mistake, you're afraid to not succeed because you're looking at the wrong metrics, you're looking at the wrong judgment. Me, I would have said, good job if you gave me everything that you had, that's all I've ever been looking for. But you don't think it'd measure up to everyone else or to what you were thinking, so you went and buried it. He says, you know what? That servant goes out where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That servant gets thrown out and he gets thrown into hell. That's how they are describing hell. Because you got to understand what he's saying. That wicked servant didn't just say, I don't feel like doing it. That wicked servant said, God, you're not good and you can't be trusted. God, I know better than you, so I'm going to do what I want with your money. And God, the things that you gave me, I use for how I want, not how you want. Which is how all of us have lived. Which is why it's a really good thing that the person telling this parable has always done what God wanted. That Jesus Christ has always used all of his talents, all of his opportunity, all of his ability to be faithful to God. He took that faithfulness to the cross, died and resurrected again. So that while we wait for him, we can stay ready and say, God, what have you given me? What opportunities have you put in front of me so that I can glorify you with everything that I have? And we can all stop being ugly and looking at everybody else's judgment. And start looking at God's. That's what we learn in the parable of the talents. Is that I got to stop looking at what everyone else says and start looking at what God says. And then measure my life accordingly. What does God say success is? What does God say faithfulness and obedience is? Because all of those things have been purchased by Christ. So he gives me carte blanche to go out there and try and actually fail for him. You can actually fail and be more faithful than being successful sometimes. How do I know that? Well, we just talked about how they were given certain talents and all they were supposed to do is double up with it. That's all they were supposed to do. The question I want to ask you is we did this demonstration, illustration, showing that we all have different weights. We all look around like, dang, that doesn't seem fair, forgetting the fact that I actually know what I'm doing, that God knows what he's doing. And then we compete. Who won? Who won that competition? Actually, don't, I don't know her name. I'm sorry. should have asked that. But how many of y'all would say, my young lady right here that had the tens won? Right? So a couple of y'all. So some of y'all are being honest. would be like, I would say she won. The rest of y'all are like, you're probably trying to do a trick question here, and I am, but you still are supposed to raise your hand. Right? Because most of y'all would say right here that she won. But here's the question. What was the rule to the game? To hold it up as long as you can. This never fails. The rule is to hold it up as long as you can. Did she hold it up as long as she could? Where's she at? Oh my God, where's she at? Is she in here? Was that as long as you could hold it? No. You said what? Did I say put it down? Did I? Did I? I didn't. I said. I said. I was right here because I was like. Rewind. <laughs> he just went down. Y'all were letting him go down. I guess he's the last one down. Shoot. Last one standing. And then everyone said yay. And then. <sighs> <laughs> but that wasn't it, though. That wasn't it, right? Because everyone's cheering because I'm the last one. I'm not picking on you. This literally happens to everybody. Because. That was the last one because everyone else went down. Great, now I've been successful. Now I've won. When God said, man, use it. Hold it as long as you possibly can. It may only be one second more. But when we're competing, when we're living according to what God has called us to do, the standard changes. Like right here, the 25s, where am the guy at? Did you try to hold him up? Right? I, it didn't work too well, though, did it? Right? <laughs> Because they're 25s, but how much of, how many times do we do the same thing? We look at this and be like, God, I can't handle this. God, why would you give me this? Why would you give me 25s? Give me the 10s. That's what I want. That's what will be better for me. And God said, man, quit. You're looking at it the wrong way. I told you to hold it up as long as you could. You went and did one of these. (sighs) 
Amen, brother. That's called being faithful. <laughs> that's called being faithful. And that's everyone here because they held it up as long as they could. Nope, down. I tried, dang, down. But the way that we look at that would say, man, I failed. I didn't win. But that's what happens when you look at things through the world's eyes instead of through God's eyes. When he says, look, I know how I created you. I know what I gave you. and I know what I've called you to do. That's success. Not what everyone else defines. And so with that, let's stop being ugly. Stop trying to be a duckling when you're meant to be a swan. Stop trying to be someone else when God created you to be someone specific, someone unique. Go be you. Go be who God has created you to be, trusting in Christ and following him, saying, Lord, how would you have me to live, and how can I do that to the best of my ability? Appreciate y'all. Thank you, bro. Thank you, Kevin. Praise God. At this time, we're going to have a refuge come out. We're not dismissed yet. And uh, how about being all that God's created us to be? You know what? Follow Jesus with all you got. Amen? It's awesome to not compare. There's a lot of freedom in that. And uh, if I have some faculty members or staff that were going to pray this morning, if you could come down. And also, Kevin's going to be down here. I'll also be down here. Uh, refuge, I'm going to let them play. And actually, I'll, I'll close this in prayer, and then we'll go into worship. And if you want to come down at that time and pray. But uh, after I pray, um, you will be dismissed. Father, thank you for this word. Uh, Lord, thank you for reminding us that you have called us and you have equipped us to do exactly what you've called us to do. And Lord, it's not by might or power, but by the spirit of the living God. And Lord, would you help us not to compare to others, but keep our eyes on Jesus. And Lord, may we truly follow you with all that we are. Lord, may this be a reminder that you have truly blessed us to be a blessing. And Lord, may we truly honor you with our lives that, Lord, we would love to please you. Thank you that you love us. Lord, may you seal this in our hearts in Jesus' name. Please come forward for prayer, and, uh, and quietly you are dismissed as we go into worship.